Welcome back. The title of this mini lecture is French and Dutch Colonization in the 17th Century. Now, we're going to gear this particularly around the Americas, but of course the French and the Dutch had colonial inroads really all over the world uh, in the 17th century like other European powers did uh, at the time. We're going to talk about five terms uh, that you should keep your eye out for uh, as you go to do your reading and learn more about the topic. All right, so first, Champlain. All right, there are a number of, you know, explorers, for lack of a better phrase, uh, you know, expeditionary folks, uh, you know, in the employ of the, the Dutch and the English and, and many others. And Samuel de Champlain uh, is a key figure for the French. Uh, so uh, Jacques Cartier uh, was a figure earlier, uh, but when it came to this idea of clearly establishing a settlement in what would be New France and eventually modern Canada, it's Champlain and his expeditions uh, that really kind of set this process up. Now, why is that? Well, number two, Quebec. Okay, Quebec. So Quebec City, and eventually the province itself, will be a, a very central part uh, in the early kind of establishment of New France, the colony of New France, uh, which exists uh, until the, the late 1700s before uh, the, the British kind of take it over uh, with the... Uh, Seven Years' War. Now, Quebec as a city uh, is founded off the St. Lawrence River, and it's up on a kind of a ridge or hill line, uh, and it's a, it's a walled city, uh, and it's a you know good for for maritime traffic, but it's also good for for trade, uh, and it's a good protection point. It's kind of a good you know way to get into the hinterland, and you know kind of a good choke point for all that. Uh, so. You know, Quebec City would be fought over between the English forces and the French forces really throughout the 17th and into the 18th centuries. Uh, there tended to be a lot of sieges of Quebec, uh, and uh, it really means a lot to uh, Canadian and also French-Canadian identity. That's a big part of that. All right, uh, number three, fur trade. So making a, a profit, uh, you know, being successful uh, in New France and then eventually Canada, uh, there were you know, different ways in which you could do that, right? So in a colonial setting, you want to kind of extract resources from the, the colonial area, and you want to export those resources to a place where they can be turned into finished product. Uh, and I'm not justifying it. This is just kind of how they did it. Uh, and in, you know, New France, fur trading is going to be a big part of this. Now, this is going to be true with the French as much as it's also going to be true with the British and uh, the English later. Uh, you know, the the major fur trading companies are going to be an active part of the British colonial economy, uh, you know, across that part of, of North America. Uh, so control of the fur trade uh, dictates then uh, how the colonial government relates with uh, the First Nations peoples uh, and uh, also the kinds of economy or forms of economy that uh, settlers can get involved in, uh, you know, questions of material culture as well, what folks can have access to, uh, in particular beaver pelts, beaver, uh, the skins, uh, the furs, uh, those were very highly valued uh, in Europe in the 17th and 18th century, uh, and this is going to kind of be a, a high point where that gets, you know, kind of ramped, uh, ramped up. Uh, all right, number four, uh, grand settlement. A grand settlement. So you have a, a wide variety of uh, a very diverse, um, you know, series of, of First Nations peoples and communities really across modern Canada uh, in the 17th and early 18th centuries. And a number of them, uh, of course, are in conflict uh, with uh, the French and other settlers. Uh, and those conflicts kind of go on uh, really till about 1701, where there's this big settlement, this sort of treaty, this agreement uh, to have a measure of, of, of peace uh, here, uh, and that there should be some sort of action or a stake, uh, you know, a position for, for these First Nations peoples. All right, last one, uh, Manhattan, right? So we don't tend uh, in the 21st century to think of the Dutch as having that much to do uh, with the colonial American story. Uh, if we do, it's, you know, part of a trivia thing, right? That's about it. But especially when it comes to the creation of what would eventually be New York, the Dutch have a big role to play. So 
eventually in the 1620s what happens is the Dutch are going to make their way there they're going to see the viability of the waters around uh, Manhattan Island and they're going to purchase what the indigenous communities think is the right of use but they feel of course that they're purchasing the land itself uh, with their colonial trading companies they're going to establish a series of kind of fort and communities uh, to trade and export uh, and then eventually to grow their colony and this you know really reflects a couple of things certainly one uh, Manhattan reflects this question over uh, European understandings of private property and of course within uh, Native American or indigenous communities questions of usury rights or uh, and right of use uh, and this clearly also of course demonstrates really uh, Dutch colonial practices and policies, and also, of course, the differences between uh, things like religious identity and property ownership in the New Netherlands versus, say, colonial Virginia or colonial Massachusetts. Uh, so, uh, you know, broadly, uh, you can look at the colonial New Netherlands as being a bit more open uh, than, you know, some of these places, again, like colonial Massachusetts. All right. Thanks so much.